Gerald Brommer, artist, educator, and author, is well known for his innovative paintings combining watercolor and collage. In this program, he will first show how to apply collage and combine it with watercolor in a series of explanatory demonstrations. He will then complete a mountain landscape painting using the collage and watercolor process. The, the, this program we're going to be working with a uh, collage and watercolor combination, combining the water painting of watercolor with some rice paper collage, collaging with oriental, uh, various oriental papers. The, uh, the collage technique itself is what we're going to be delving into today, but the purpose of working with collage actually is to really enhance these textures. You can almost feel the surface of this, uh, of this painting that it's almost a Van Gogh-like quality even though it's watercolor. And the textural quality that we can get out of this is something that can't be painted any other way. We can't do it with oils, can't do it with acrylics, can't do it with watercolor on paper unless you use this, this uh, time, kind of a collage technique. So the, and, and the other purpose really of working with rice paper is that it gives the watercolorist an alternative way of working. The watercolor and collage process involves several steps. At first we have to paint a little bit so we get some color underneath then collaging the papers over the top of that so that we get some light and color coming through the papers. Then we paint over the top of that. All of this involves drying time. Between the painting and the collage, we have to allow paper, paint to dry. Between the collage and the paint, we have to allow time to dry. And then, if we want to, we can recollage over the top of some of that, whatever it might happen to be, and then paint back over the top of that until we're done. Actually, these last two steps, we can keep alternating those and keep doing them until the painting is finished might take a year or more to finish that, but we know we can keep on painting until it's all done. Let me show you how that works. The, the painting part, first of all, we paint right on the, on the paper, and this really doesn't have to be done with a whole lot of detail because we're going to cover it all up anyway. And after the painting is done and dried, then we collage over the top of it, cover the most of the painted surface. I like to do all of it, actually, but cover most of the painted surface with different kinds of rice paper. We'll show you those in, in just a little bit. And after that has been dried for a little bit, so, it's, so the paint will stay up on top, then we, have to, then we paint back over the top of that again. And we have, just use a watercolor and a brush, and you just work on that with a very dry brush. And we'll explain that and show it to you in detail in, in a few moments. After that, we can paint back or collage back into that again, adding more paper, putting more paper in places if we want to change the outside shapes a little bit so we can get light into the, into the center of the focal area of the, of the painting. We can add a little bit more paper and paint over that. If we don't like that, we can add a little more paper and paint over that. It gives us the privilege of working back into the work again without having to start all over from scratch. When we work with these, uh, with a non-objective format, actually, we'll be, we want to try several kinds of design formats here, but, but we don't want to do that too much right now. Any format will work. We can use squares inside of squares. We can use the cruciform, which I like to use. We can use all horizontal, all vertical. Any kind of format will, will suffice. But I'm going to be working with a cruciform format, and you'll see why I like to do that in, in just a little bit. I'm also going to be working on squares with these little non-objective studies. I have found that, that uh, through years of teaching that, that people can do non-objective things in squares where they can't do them in rectangles. As soon as you get a rectangle, it seems like everybody wants to put a line on and have a, a landscape, sky above and, and land below. But when you get a square, then we can stay a little bit more non-objective. When I do this, I like to divide this square, not actually physically, but mentally, divide it into a, like a tic-tac-toe kind of a, of a format. And then in one of those places where these lines cross, makes a good focal point. We don't have to have a focal point all the time, but it makes a good focal point. So if we start there with a focal point in here, and if I bridge across this way to the outside of that, of that uh, little square, and then, I, and then I have a bridge from one side to the other. And then if I come down from the top with another bridge, it's going to bridge from the, from the top down to the bottom of the page. I'll be involving the whole page in the design. The movement will go this way into the design, come down into it from the sides, also goes in the negative space this way. So that a bridging across, and make that an interesting bridge, and then an interesting bridge going down this way, some interesting kind of shape, and where they cross will naturally be a focal point. The thing you want to watch for is that these negative spaces out here are all different shapes. 
See, different sizes and different shapes, because this is the way the movement goes into the, into the focal part of the painting. So we start with something like that, and I'll show you that with watercolor in just a moment. Uh, where we start with that, then we will have no trouble holding the whole painting together, the whole drawing and sketch together. I'm going to start this one by putting the color, starting with the color and the focal point in that spot that we plotted out there before, and then building the, the, uh, the color out to the edge. We don't want to draw that. I don't want to get too involved with even how that looks. This is just to be a nice, fun kind of, uh, of a shape here. I can scratch in that with the handle of the brush. You can scratch with your fingernails in that. All the things you always wanted to do on a piece of paper where, but were afraid to do it in your painting, you can do that on here. Just play with that. I'm going to keep probably uh, using two colors uh, and then, and then uh, don't get too involved with too many colors in this little small space. So this is a cruciform. See, it's a cross-like shape. It isn't really a cross, but it's a cross-like shape. I'm working on a seven and a half inch squares, and that, there's nothing magic about seven and a half inches, except that you can get six of these out of a half sheet of paper without, uh, without wasting any color at all, or any paper at all. So here I'll add a little bit of color in the, in the focal point, in this focal area, and then we have to let this dry. Let's see, two colors, and I can get a nice, here I'm again worried about the shapes in the corners, that each of those is a little bit different. I can blot a little bit out of that with a Kleenex, lift a little bit, scratch a little bit. And this is, you know, really all we have to do with that. I'll do one more, and I'll start it a little bit differently. I'll start from the outside over here from this edge and work across the page this way and, and do my, my uh, bridging this way. And just this can be, if you do six of these out of a half sheet of paper, you can get all kinds of, of uh, variety even by using a, even by using one of these these uh, using one size piece of paper, you can get a tremendous number of of, uh, of examples and very ty various types. I've, pro I've probably seen ten thousand of these done, and no two have ever been alike. So there's no way that you can make one like an, like somebody else has already done it. So you can do all these scratching things. Use your fingernail. You can do with your finger if you want. Draw in there, and you know. Use a pointed brush and, and play with a little bit. Spatter some, just so you get a nice arrangement of going across there. It's a very kind of a pleasing thing. We're really not looking for any kind of subjects. The reason that I like to work this way with a non-objective surface, first of all, is that we're going to learn to work with the material, see what the material does. If we tried to do trees and houses and clouds and everything the first uh, right off the bat, we'd have a lot of trouble trying to, to accomplish that. But this gives us some kind of a little design as you'll see, you'll end up with a nice little, little product when we get done with it. So this is the way, the, uh, you know, the way these cruciform designs can look. I'm going to work on a couple of, of new squares, not the other ones, because this, these have already been done and they're dried already, and I don't want to let, wait, take time to let the other ones dry. Now on top of these, we'll be collaging Japanese rice papers, oriental rice papers. Rice papers come in like 50 different varieties or more. There's a little catalog from one supplier here that's got all kinds of these papers in them. And literally, there are dozens and dozens of these kinds of papers. Some have a lot of fibers, some have no fibers at all. And some are very thick, some are very thin, some of the colors will show through, some they won't. The papers come in very large sheets. They come in sheets that are like 24 by 36, like this. Some of them are very expensive and some of them are very reasonable. You just and the ones you like will be very expensive, undoubtedly. But I rip these papers down to, so I can use them. And, uh, and I tear them up like this into, into s small workable sizes. And some of them tear easier than, than others. And, uh, and I sometimes have a big mess around when I, when I get done tearing these. After I tear them the lengthways, then I tear them into, into s smaller pieces this way. And in my drawer, I usually have several dozen kinds of papers in, in, uh, in torn in sizes like this. When I start to use them, I even tear these down into smaller pieces when I put them on the, uh, on the, on the painting after a while. I use the, uh, for an adhesive, I use a, a polyvinyl acetate glue. This happens to be Elmer's, but you can also use acrylic medium if you want. And that can be diluted with water, and, uh, and, and I use a, a stiff bristle brush. You have to use a brush that's, that's stiff enough so you can push the, the glue around on the paper. If you use an old watercolor brush, it won't work. 
And I like to dilute the, the glue and the water like this, just and mix it on a piece of cardboard in between, in between here. Uh, you don't want to get fancy with all this mixing stuff. The reason that I like to mix it like this is that I can control the thickness of the glue. When it looks about like this, it's just right. If the glue is too thin, then it won't, the paper won't stick. If the glue is too thick, it will be shiny, and the, and the watercolor after a while will not, will not soak into the surface at all. And I don't like to mix the water with the glue because you get too much the same, the same thickness. If the papers are thicker that I'm gluing down, I like to use a little thicker glue. If the papers are thinner, I can use a little bit more water. And there's no formula, really, how that, that can work. Glue tends to get thicker when it sits around your studio for a while, so you don't really know how much water to mix with it until you just put it on the cardboard like this and work with it. I like to work on a brown piece of cardboard this way rather than any kind of, of archival material because you're able to see the thickness of the glue. If you do this on white paper, you can't see just how thick that glue is. And when it's about like this, it's ready to, we're ready to go to work. In the gluing process now, the idea is to take the, the glue, put it on, the, on top of the watercolor, put the paper down, and then squash the, glue, the paper back down on there again. So the glue that I put down needs to be bigger than the piece of paper that I'm going to put down. Put the paper down, take the brush, and just really flatten it down on, that, on the surface. You want any edges sticking up at all. That has to be firmly adhered to the surface. It's best also if there are no bubbles underneath or anything, because that'll cause problems after a while. Papers can be overlapped when you put them down. Let me use a little thicker paper. Some of these, as I said before, are, are more transparent than others, so the, the, and some are more opaque. So we'll hide it with some, hide some of that color underneath with some of these papers. But I try to use a variety of papers in, in uh, and in, even in the same small space as this. Look, here's one that's got a lot of fibers, a lot of fibers in it. And I like these fiber ones to put, see, even out into the negative space, then coming back into the positive area here. So that acts as a transition from one part to the other. Those, those, those fibers actually act as lines leading your eye from one part of the surface to another. And see, these fibers all become a, a very important part of the painting after a while important part of the process. Some of these papers are, have a little bit of tone to them. These are the natural colors before they've been bleached. And I don't want to get all the same kind of paper all in the same kind of, of uh, in the same area of the painting either. Another thing you want to be careful of a little bit when you're, when you're applying the, the collage is that you don't just keep applying collage in the same place and pile it up because the glue will dry on the surface first and not underneath. It'll take a long time for it to dry. That's why when I have a big painting to work on, I usually work all over that painting at the, at the same time. Even here with this one, at this stage, I'll go over and work on the one on the right side a little bit, the, uh, the second one, just so I don't have to pile too much glue up on that first one. So I get over here on the second one, do the same thing. Now, if you watch when I apply the, the, the uh, color, the, the, I mean the, the glue to the paper, I put that down just in as few strokes as possible. If I brush too much, the, the watercolor will redissolve and come up and I'll get orange glue or pink glue or something like that, which is not a very happy thing to have happen. So if you just brush a couple of times, leave it alone, and then, then, uh, then seal it down. I don't add any more glue to the top of this. I don't want any more glue on top of this than there is on there now. So I just use whatever is left in the brush. By the time I put this brush stroke down, I've taken most of the glue out of the brush, then add the paper, and then just use this to seal it down. You could use your fingers to seal it down or anything, but you just get glue all over your fingers, and it's a lot easier to, to, uh, to do it like this, and, and it, it works a lot more quickly. So a variety of papers, and even in the focal point here, where this focal point is, cover up all the things that are underneath. Sometimes, in the process of putting this, the, uh, the papers down, you will, you'll, uh, you'll find places that are so good that you don't want to touch them. You don't want to cover them up. You don't have to cover them up. You can leave some of the original watercolor showing. Some of these papers are more opaque. Now watch, if I want to change the shape of this negative space out here, I can put that paper out here and, and bring a white shape and change the shape of that white, that, uh, that white negative space up there. So my objective is to cover that all of that cruciform shape and uh, until that's till there's no really painted surface left all of it's been covered
When you begin to paint on top of this collage surface now, I've used another square, other set of squares here also to allow these, these have been dried already for some time. When you work on top of these, this collage surface now, the surface is no, not as receptive to watercolor as the original watercolor paper is, nor is it as receptive as the original rice paper is, because the rice paper is made to absorb printing ink. That's very, very absorbent. And you know what the watercolor paper, the absorbency of that is. But with the glue that we've introduced into this surface, we no longer have that amount of absorbency. So we have to work on top of this surface with a very dry brush. This is really very important. And I take the brush that, that I'm using. It doesn't have a whole lot of water on it anyway here. But I blot it on a piece of Kleenex before I put it on the, on the, uh, on, on the little painted part. Now watch what happens to that surface as I pull that brush across there. The textures that happen underneath that surface, underneath that, that brush, are amazing. And, and all of that, it's, it seems very textured and very detailed and everything underneath there, but I haven't done anything except draw a flat brush stroke across it. Now, just let me develop that a little bit. I'll just pull again with a very dry brush. See what happens with those textures? Because of all the variety of textures that are underneath there, I can draw with a long time on this brush without getting any more color added to it. Now I'm gonna follow the same sort of configuration with that cruciform, but it's not the same as what was underneath. I'm not concerned with what was underneath there at all. That's not a, uh, an objective. All I wanna do now is really respond to the textures and everything that are happening on top of this, of this, uh, of this collage surface. See, now I'll just put these, put some color on there, and I won't manipulate the brush very much at all. Twist it maybe a little bit, just get a little bit of, of uh, and this is just a flat brush, get a little bit of flat brush stroking on here. But all that does is just keep creating more and more uh, beautiful and, and, uh, and fascinating textures in there. Now, while that's, while that's drying, I'm going to go work on the other one over here for a minute, just so you can see, again, how, how that can be done. I'll start with a... With a, uh, with a round brush this time and, uh, and give you a little different kind of a start to this, to this thing. Now just watch how that, how that will work. You use oftentimes a different color than what you've got underneath also. But see, I can just, if I take this brush and just squish around this way with it, instead of just brushing it on, the paper does a lot of the work. I don't have to plan ahead of time. What I would like to do here, for example, now, just take, see this line that runs down, that fiber line that runs down there? I'll just take that fiber line and just continue it through another part of the page. Here again, now here's a shape, here's an edge. See that little edge in there? Let me darken that a little bit. Continue it down here. See what I want to, feeling I want to get always is I'm reacting to what's on the paper here. There's a little fiber that runs through there. Look, I can hook that fiber up to the other fiber over here. You know, you can just weave the painting, weave back and forth across the painting. There's a, there are colors that you're applying to the top of this. There are also colors that are coming through from underneath. I don't want to cover all of those up. I can leave some of those showing through. This is a color against this color. So I have really a, a, a feeling of the layering from color underneath, then the fiber paper over the top of that, then paint on top of that yet. So the, the, uh, that whole thing can develop just beautifully as you work on it. Look, you can get darker with it if you, if you wish. That can get very dark after a while, especially if you're working on, the, on, the, uh, on dry paper. That those, those lines can get very, very intense. But I like to build it up gradually to the, uh, to the darkness that, that, uh, that it might attain after a while. So this is just a, a kind of a process where I'm just reacting to, to what's underneath. There's some fiber lines there. There's an edge of a shape. See the edge of this shape down here? If I come in here and just use that edge, continue that shape in there, then I've just extended that shape. This is a wonderful way to learn to play with, with shapes. I still want to finish this, this corner up. This is too big a, an undefined area in here. So if I hold my finger in, I can get an idea of how that could work. So I'm going to 
put some color in this way. So I have a little shape, light shape that comes down into the into the center of the of the uh, painting here. It still allows this light shape to move up this way. That also completes my cruciform uh, a little bit, and it allows these all these corners to have a little different uh, a little different feeling about them. Now look at the one on the left for just a minute. Let me show you something that that we need to do with this one. The uh, the, the upper shape up in the upper right hand corner is not allowed to get down in here into the into the uh, central part of the painting. I'm blocked off by dark all over this way. So if I want to to lighten that up again, I just need to get a little bit of glue and uh, and a piece of paper, and I can reintroduce light into that into this part of the painting, so that your eye can f can follow down from the from the negative space into the positive. If I want to make that a little more intense, I can use a little, a little more opaque piece of paper and then paint over it again. What we've done, really, is to do this cruciform, react to the little, the little fibers and everything that are on there. Let me put a mat over part of this once now. Instead of a square mat, let me put a little rectangular mat over this and, and uh, watch what happens to this, this little design. All of a sudden, because I put it in a little rectangular shape, it becomes an uh, abstracted landscape. Now, not only will it, I can move this around and find all kinds of things this way. Look what happens. I turn the paper this way. Look what happens to it. I can move it around and get all kinds of different non-objective little landscape things. And I turn it, make it a quarter turn. Each way I turn it, it becomes a completely different painting. Look at the first one, or the second one that we did here. We'll do the same thing with this. See the shapes that are in there? That makes a nice little abstract. Uh, nice little abstract painting. Watch if I move that around. It becomes a completely different painting. I can move it up and down. The mat is just a little bit smaller than the, than the paper in order to allow that to happen. What I'm going to do with this program now is to, is to make a painting of Yosemite Valley with a half dome and, and El Capitan and some rocks, trees, and, and uh, thistles and so on. What I want to do is to work from old paintings. These are a couple of my old paintings that I did of Yosemite several years ago. And one of the things we have in our studio as resource is all our old paintings. We've got, we can use parts of them, all of them, redo them, change the colors, change the time of year, anything to make them different. But I'm going to use these as resource materials this time for this, this painting. So I've made sketches. I've taken the main elements out of, out of these. Uh, El Capitan is a big mountain at the entrance of Yosemite, half dome off in the distance, some of the big pine trees that are, that are there, some rocks that we'll put in the foreground. And although these are winter paintings that I worked from before, that I painted before, I think I'll paint this time in the autumn. And so we can put some thistles or some flower, autumn flowers or something in the foreground of the painting. So I've sketched those elements a little bit, the, the, ha the El Capitan, the half dome, the trees, the rocks, and the thistles. And we'll use those as input in putting this painting together. I can put them together in a number of ways. Now, what I've done with these now is to put the is to try a few different positions of, of these major elements. I did El Capitan as this is just a real rough sketch, as you can see. El Capitan is just a shape over here. I can move it past the center of the page, putting a half dome in the back. I can leave El Capitan over here on this side of the page with half dome in the center. This would probably mean that this is going to be the focal point of the painting back in here. And this other one, the El Capitan might be. In the third one down here, it's about two-thirds of the way across the page. And I've brought in something in the foreground on, on the right side. The trees can go any place in here. I can reposition or position those any place in the rocks. I want to get these major big elements in the back. Here I've come up rather close on it, just seeing a little bit of El Capitan and the tops of the mountains and so on. Actually, there's really little room for rocks or anything in the foreground of this one. Now look at the one down here where I begin to feel kind of what I want to do here. I pull the El Capitan so it comes just a little bit shy of the center of the, of the painting, leaving, leaving Half Dome. In other words, this area, of Half Dome and El Capitan, will all become kind of focal points together. Putting a few trees in here, thistles down here, some rock shapes in the, in the foreground. Now that's, I feel comfortable with that. I kind of like that. Now if we look over here, I just Done, done a little value study here. El Capitan here. The trees darker in the front, shadow on on half dome in the back. 
maybe a medium white sky up there. I don't really know how this is all going to go, and, and, uh, and some thistles and things in the foreground. When I start to work on this now, I will put this down very, very rapidly and, and very roughly, because I'm going to collage over almost all of this anyway. And remember, this all these rocks in Yosemite have tremendous textures, so even at, from a distance. And all these thistles and things will be very wonderful material to work with as, as a, with the collage technique. So with a subject matter now, instead of an abstract, I'm going to have to plan this a little bit, paint very rapidly, then collage, and then begin to paint back over the top again. I'm going to be drawing with a brush rather than a pencil to start this. And I'm just going to I'll put this on very roughly. This is the, this is the figure, feeling of, of uh, El Capitan, that nice big big shape up there. There's a little lip that comes out behind that. It's another, another uh, mountain shape behind it there. And then Half Dome and its relationship to the, to the rest of this kind of has a feeling like this back there about as far as size is concerned. I probably made it a little bit bigger than it really would be, but that's all right. I like the, the uh, shape of Half Dome there anyway. And there's some nice mountain shapes in the back here. So this is just very, very roughly put in here. And on the, on the right side, there's a big cliff we'll have come down in here. We're going to put a tree in there anyway, so we'll be hiding a lot of that cliff, but I want to get the feeling of it. There's also a big swooping side of, a, of the, the uh, canyon that comes down this way. It's got a very gentle arc. It's all full of trees there. In the foreground down here, we're going to put some big rock shapes this way. There are a lot of granite boulders in Yosemite, and we'll just put a bunch of those granite boulders down here. It'll help give a foundation to the bottom of the painting here. And then maybe on the side of that, we'll put some, some thistles, because we want to make this kind of autumn-y. And we'll put some, some uh, thistle plants there just to give us a little bit of autumn color, and maybe even some leaves or something like that. And on the left side, I think maybe a smaller tree over here, so I can see the top of El Capitan, because that's got a characteristic shape. So we'll put a, uh, maybe a couple of these, a couple of, of pine trees in here. And they're kind of scrawny. They aren't really fully developed. They're up here at a high elevation, and they you know, have a very peculiar windblown kind of a look. So we'll put a little of that feeling in there, maybe a couple more rocks and things down here as the, as the painting develops. And then on the right side, uh, a tree that'll go out the top of the painting. I'll just, I want, I'd like something to break this line across the top of the painting, so we'll let this, let this uh, big pine tree over here too. Down in the foreground, we've got this nice sloping movement this way that helps repeat the shape of the valley back here actually. So we have rocks in here and some thistles and maybe some other foliage autumn kind of foliage that we can get in here, because we'll get some autumn colors in here then. The palette that I use is, is, a, is a plastic palette, Robert E. Wood palette. And I have my colors arranged almost the way the color wheel goes. The blues are all in the upper corner up here. The greens on this side. The earth colors across the bottom. Started with yellows to oranges over here. The reds are up in the corner to violet and uh, permanent magenta, and then back to, to the blues again. So it really is the way the, the color wheel is set up. I have a warm and a cool of each color, and then a few extras in be besides that. Warm and a cool green, and then the earth colors, warm and cool yellow, warm and cool oranges, warm and cool reds, and then the magenta. So this is the way my palette works. And really, I pull from those colors. Everything in the palette works with everything else in the palette. I'm going to begin by now that by, by just putting some color in, some of that light gray color of the, of the, uh, of the Brock Mountains there in, in Yosemite. And I don't have to worry about details or anything at all here. This is just putting some color down so that the rice paper can go on top of that after a while. I will go back to Half Dome back here and, and, uh, and put that shape in. And remember that all these things can become lighter after a while by adding more paper to it and so on. A few of these mountains in the back. And these have snow on them all year back here, so I'll leave a little light back there to indicate some of that snow in the higher elevations there. One of the things that, that when you work this way, you don't have to be careful at all about this very first part. And it gives you a nice freedom to paint almost gesturally with, uh, with big strokes to, to uh, put that color in there.
Now we'll just do a little bit with the sky up there. We'll just leave a little bit of white up there too. Always change that later on. So put a little bit of blue up there and then get, just get some water and just soften that down a little bit and lift some of that off of there and with a Kleenex a little bit so we get a nice feeling of sky. We can put a little blue right over the, to make this, to make the rock stand out a little bit. And I can use the Kleenex here too, just to soften those edges. And, and uh, I can always build the sky up to make it work with the rest of the painting. I don't want to be, this is not going to get collaged on it, by the way, the, the sky. Sky will, will uh, remain kind of the way it is with the brush strokes and, and uh, so on showing. But I can alter that after a while in order to fit the rest of the painting, whatever we want to want to do with that. So we'll just get a little bit of, a little bit more color down in here. These are just like the nice autumn afternoon sky up in the, in Yosemite. I'll mix a little alizarin crimson with the green color to gray it down somewhat. And so we get a kind of a grayish green back here and that's nice. Now this is gonna be, this is just a whole hillside full of trees. There must be 10,000 acres of, of uh, wonderful trees back in here. So right now that's just gonna be green. We just changed 10,000 acres of trees into a green shape. That's all we need over there. And we'll bring it right behind these, these trees too. The trees are not the important part of the painting. Now we have a feeling of foreground this is the middle ground back in here, and this is the background. Then we get way back to the deep, to deep, deep space in the back here. So this is the way the painting looks. Now this is a very quick, few-minute sketch of Yosemite Valley. Now, to some people, they might like this painting the way it is. I'm going to take this now and let it dry, and then cover this all with different kinds of rice papers, and then we'll get into the painting on top of those papers to get that texture. Before I begin painting on this, I'll just mention the fact that I'm, I'm working on 300 pound rough paper. The rough paper actually is the best thing to, to work on because the quality of the rice paper that we're adding, when it touches the, touches the, uh, the rough paper, there's not a whole lot of difference in the character of that surface. If you worked on a very smooth surface, on a high surface, then you'd be able to tell right where the paper ended. That's not too good. Also, you should work on a 300 pound sheet, which gives you plenty of solidity to work on. If the paper is too flimsy that you're working on and you're collaging a lot of things on top of it, the, the paper, the ground that you're working on ought to be more substantial really than the paper that you're putting on it. Now when I start to add rice paper to this now, as you'll see, I won't care really about the edges of this. Like I'll put a piece of paper here, this is going to go over the top of the tree and the, the cliff. I'm not going to be tearing paper to fit cliff shapes or rock shapes or anything like that, except out on the edges someplace. But in the, in, the, uh, in the surface itself, I'll just, be, I'll just be putting paper down kind of randomly. It almost one piece of paper can be, like this piece of paper can be three things, the, this piece of paper. It'll be part of, the, of El Capitan, it'll be part of the, of the forest on this hill, it'll be part of this tree. So that the papers don't have to go in any specific, any specific place. And even on these, on the surface back here that I'm, that I'm putting down, I'm not going to be concerned even with the same kind of paper all over. The fact is, the more variety I have with that, the better I like it, the better I like to, to uh, work on the, on, the, uh, on the painting part after a while. You have to keep in mind, really, that the, the process of putting collage down on here, all I'm doing is really getting the surface ready for the painting. So I, I, some of these papers you'll find out will make better rocks and some will make better trees and things like that, but generally, all I want to be concerned with is the fact that, that, uh, that, that, I'm, that I'm making this textured surface and the painting's going to take place on top of that. Now when I get to the edge of El Capitan between the, between the mountain and the sky back here, that I want to keep that line kind of clean. Because if I don't, if I get too much glue or get glue off in the sky back here, if I want to make the sky darker, that's going to be a little resist there. The glue will resist the, the, uh, the paint after a while. So I, don't want to get too rambunctious with the paper, with the glue rather, as it goes out into the sky. So at that edge, maybe it's a good idea to, to be a little bit more careful. The papers, when I tear those papers, the, the, you put the paper down the way the rock goes. For example, this is a long pull on this rock here like this, and I don't want to put the papers crosswise because I want most of the striations in the rock and so on to be 
to be vertical. So I put the paper down in a, in a vertical way. Some of these papers that are, are, uh, are more neutral, maybe those colors will be distracting after a while. And I'll have to cover those up with white paper again. But I'll just, I just keep working this. See, this is part tree, that rock, that piece of paper is part tree and, and, and part rock up there. And I want to make sure as I do this over this big sheet of paper that everything is glued down thoroughly. The, uh, the collaging process just takes a lot of time. It's just, and you don't really have to think too much about doing that. You cover up the, all the painted surface or as much of it as you, as you intend to cover, and you don't have to really think too much about doing that because the, unless the textures really mean what you want, the, want them to say. If you want to have rocks that certain papers make good rocks, you can use those rocks. Otherwise, it just takes 45 minutes or so to fill a full sheet of, of paper. When this gets all finished, then it's going to take a, take a while for that to dry, and then we'll come back and, and, uh, and paint into this again. And really, the painting takes place now, after this takes, gets done. What I've really done now is prepare this surface for the painting. I can draw on this, or I can start painting directly on this. I can do anything I want with this after this is dry. But this is a wonderful, wonderful, sensitive surface on which to begin to paint. After this surface has dried now, after the collage surface is all dried, then you begin to put the painting on top of this surface. Now, I can paint directly, which is what I'm going to do, or you can draw on this. Now, see, I can just take, the, take a pencil and I can draw on here if you like to predict where you're going to go. Put the lines in and, the, and do anything you want to, to define spaces and everything you want to paint in. I'll probably prefer just to, on this surface anyway, just to start to paint on here. So I'll take the... I'll start with the, just where we started with the collaging process up here in, the, in, the, in El Capitan itself. And just begin, remember, with a very dry brush, just blotting the color off again, begin to put a little bit of color on here. Now, I'm going to add color very lightly. Don't want to start as dark as it's going to be at all. I want to gradually build up to the darks. But I'll just begin to put some of this, some of this uh, color on. And just, again, very, very lightly. I always think... Of, of you just almost caress the paper with the brush. Don't get in there and beat the, the uh, surface to death. Just gradually get in, just start to add these striations of color. Now, you can begin to see in some places already that this looks almost finished, you know, the, the way that appears to be there. But I, you know, will be adding more color and everything to that. Here I'm going to make it dark this, darken this little cliff that comes out behind that this rock face so I can really get this surface right here of El Capitan. That's a very, to people who know Yosemite, a very, very recognizable kind of, uh, of line that runs down there. Now, do half dome there. I'll just begin to, to uh, get the shape of that a little bit. But this is all very lightly done, not in anywhere near the, the kind of depth of uh, value that it's going to have after a while. But see, that... Now, that's not a very predictable texture that's in there. I, I didn't know what was going to happen in there. The reason that some of these are a little darker and some are a little lighter is that there is a little more glue in some places than there is in others. And that unpredictability, to me, is a very exciting kind of a, of a feature to work with. Just never really know what's going to happen. There are people who like to coat this whole surface with a, with a mixture of acrylic medium and, uh, and watercolor, uh, acrylic medium and water, a mixture of those two, just to get a a, uh, a uniform surface. But I kind of like the the fact that it's not very uniform. Now, uh, see all of these. Look what happens. All the textures underneath that those uh, the brush when it goes down. See, all of that is unpredictable. But that just makes very beautiful textures and, and very rich surfaces. See, I leave some light in there. I could always go back in and add and make things darker, but I'll leave a lot of light. And this is just a very pale kind of wash that goes on here. 
Now we'll get right down here to the to the bottom of the valley down here, and we can get this feeling of the the valley floor down here as it goes back into the into the canyon back there. And then we'll get down into the foreground with some of the with some of these rocks down here. And here again, they're going to be just warmed up just a little from what they were in the uh, in the early part of the painting in the uh, in the original painting. But now. Just look, uh, some of these, I'm not going to do anything to the tops of these rocks at all. I just leave the color that's underneath showing through. Let that be the amount of the, the color for right now anyway. See, and the, I can darken behind there because of the, the uh, trees in the back there. But leaving that, leaving the tops of those rocks alone. See, and then the rocks just begin to, to jump out there. They'll be much more delineated, of course, as the, as the painting develops. But you don't have to cover everything up. Sometimes the color that's underneath the, the papers gives enough color, like even in, when I get into the, into the thistles, you'll see that a little bit. So these are the, look at those textures in there. See, that's wonderful things that are happening there. And I say it's wonderful, I don't even know what's going to happen to that when I, put, when I put the color on there. We're going to go into the trees next. I'm going to, to uh, on the left side over here, just begin to, to pop some of these trees out of front of those cliffs. And you begin to feel the space between the mountain in the back and, uh, and the tree up here when this begins to, when you begin to feel this in here a little bit. Now, here again, with, the, with this dry brush, I'm just putting the color on, and the textures again will, are just happening on the, on the surface. Remember what we said about these trees, that they're not very symmetrical or, or like trees are in a park. They're really kind of uh, staggered, so we want to kind of develop that feeling too. And here's the other, the other one. We got two of them. We could also add another one if I want to, on this side here. But we'll go with two of them for the time being here anyway. Now, where the colors were underneath, and what the colors were, and and how the shapes were, doesn't make a bit of difference. The painting is really happening now. And this is the important thing to remember that you don't have to use the material that's underneath at all. You can just paint over it with something something completely different. So they, these trees now have a whole lot of texture. They're just, they're beginning to look almost finished just with the first brush strokes, and, and I'm not even really doing a whole lot of manipulating of this surface at all. Just the brush back and forth to get the feeling of those, of those trees. I don't even have to finish that. See, I can just leave some open places. I can go back in and finish them later on. Now look at the tree on the right side, and we'll go over and, and, uh, and do that. Starting at the top here and just working, working down. See, some of these things that are here, these marks that were in here from before, I'll just leave those and just build around those. What I really want to do, like with those little diagrams that we saw before, I really kind of react to what's happening on here. See the fibers that are in here? I'll use those fibers. Just use that as part of the, of the tree. Because you don't, I don't have a tree to look at, so I don't really know how I want it to look. I let the, let the painting suggest how that wants to be. So I can, when it crosses over this, this uh, other cliff behind here, it can get a little bit darker again. So I can always go and finish that after a while. That'll be the next time through the painting. I'm going to get a pointed brush now and, and do something in the thistles on the, on the lower left-hand side there. We'll get some of this brownish color in there. And, and uh, I'll leave a lot of the things that are in there, those little light spaces and so on, just put some thistle marks in there this way. See? And, I'll leave something that's there. Might not have been there at the beginning at all when I painted it, first of all, but we'll gradually develop those thistle shapes around there, and we'll fill that all in with, with darker values after a while. I can make a little round shape, use it for the head of that thistle. And this will just gradually, you know, we'll work it out to the outside out here a little bit, and then put, put another rock out there. These little darker shapes. Some of these things can be leaves. Some of them can be parts of the of the uh, crown of the thistle. But here again, just by putting some color down on there, and because of the texture, I really get that dry thistle-like quality in there, which is which is very nice. Here, I see I can just make a few round circles to be the the uh, heads of those thistle plants, and then a few little marks on the these dried marks on the outside here, and some foliage. Put a few stems in there to start with. That'll all get built up and filled in after a while, so we don't, 
want to get too much more done than that because that's just fine. I'll go to the right hand side and and, uh, and do the thistles over in here the same way. See the white things that are already there, I'll just leave and then just pop in these these little dried leaf-like things around the plants, around the blooms themselves, or it used to be blooms. Now I'll work on this band over here next on the left side that that uh, band of trees that, that uh, is off in the distance because that's kind of an important uh, separation uh, place between the, the uh, foreground and the background. So this is kind of an important area to put in here. So this will be a flattish area, but it'll have texture anyway. And I can go back in after a while and, and, uh, and add a little bit of, of, uh, of texture to make it look more like trees and so on, like fir forests or fir trees. Now that line has to continue down past these trees and come out down here. And that has to, we have to feel that line coming through there because that's characteristic of Yosemite Valley or those big sloping uh, arcs that come down into the, from the mountainside down into the, into the valley itself. So I want to be sure I have that, can feel that line going across there. I'm going over to the right hand side. Uh, Behind here, we're going to put put uh, some trees back in here also to kind of balance the green that's on the other side over here, and uh, now it won't be as much of it, and it won't be quite the same, but it'll uh, it'll help balance the painting out a little bit too, and I'll bring that right down to the to the uh, to where the thistles are going to be down here. This is also my anchor really to the right side of the painting. That can be quite dark after a while, and it'll be the anchor from my Cruciform really in this is going to go all the way across the page and then up from the tree and then down to the out the bottom down here I'll go back in and, and uh, with a pointed brush and work on those trees a little bit Let's do the one on the right side first and I'm going to put some darker some very dark greens in there and these will be have Magenta in it and everything will be very very rich darks and I just want to put a few of those in there just to Help me establish my own value pattern in here so I because I want this to be quite dark after a while I'm going to keep working around the, the big mountain back here because those textures and everything are a long ways away. I don't need to make them too detailed. I'm going to work around them first. So I'll do some of these thistles down here again and get in here with a little darker brown than was on there before and leave a little bit of white up there for the uh, crowns of these thistles and just begin to fill in some of, this, some of the negative space, the spaces in between. As that happens, this, the, this pile of thistles, this plant down here, would just begin to get richer and richer. I can put a few branches and, and twigs in there, and this just begins to it begins to get the feeling of all those leaves and everything cluttered together in, in one spot here. This is not a thistle painting, so I'm not making these with a great amount of detail. The background is still more important than this. This is just part of the stage set for that for that background. Then I'm going to work on the rocks down here in the right in the in directly in the foreground. Now, if you can if you can just Watch what happens. I'm, I'm not going to make any new rocks. I'm going to take the rocks that are there already, just enrich those the textures that are already there. Remember what I used that expression, reacting to the surface itself. When that surface suggests a little, a little intensity there, then I'll put that intensity in there so that that rock begins to get have character. You can feel the roundness of it and and uh, and, and feel the striations in it and the chunks of granite as these rocks are here, that's, can get to be a, the rocks can get to be very, very realistic looking almost if you're not, if you're not careful. And I don't want to be photographic or anything, but they actually can almost be that way. Now, I'm going to go into this, into this big uh, uh, hill of, of uh, pine trees again, and this is going to get quite dark now. It's going to look a little bit scary when I first start to put that on because it's going to seem kind of dark. But I'll wipe a little bit of it off so that the textures underneath begin to, to uh, show through again. See, I can begin to feel the different kinds of uh, the different trees up in here. Now, I can use the brush at an angle as you see this going down. So really, each mark will be about like this, and it'll almost have a tree shape to, uh, to each mark. So as I put those down on there, it isn't that I'm making a lot of trees. It's that I'm simulating a tree-like or a forest-like texture on that whole hillside there, especially near the top of it. But even as it gets down in here, if I keep doing that, I can just get that repetitive 
feeling of the uh, of hillsides full of trees. Now notice how the the with these getting darker and the, and everything getting a little bit more developed, this feels farther away. So I want that. Now this is a kind of a, a feeling that I want to retain. What I'm going to do next is on on that left side, there's this white piece that was just left alone. I didn't really know what was happening. When I stood back and looked at that, I felt this felt just like the big sheets of rock that come down in parts of Yosemite and parts of the of the uh, valley down there. So what I'm going to do is just is emphasize that a little bit. I'm just going to going to leave some of that white on top and just have these nice shadowy striations come down this way and it'll just help give that feeling of of, uh, of those big sheet of uh, big sheet of rock granite that comes down there so now I'm going to go up into the into uh, half or uh, into uh, El Capitan the big big rock up here and begin to, to uh, feel that a little bit with a little bit of dark some little darker spaces in here now I'll put it on and then take some of that off and, and so I feel some really some really some contrast in that. What I really want this to do is that this face out here of El Capitan begins to turn toward the light. So by darkening a little bit on the left side of that, I can I can enhance that feeling a little bit that that's facing out toward the toward the sun out here. I kind of like a real dry brush, and you can just drag that over the surface, and it really gives just those kind of lines of the water staining on the on the side of the of the mountain really. There's no snow on this yet at this time of year, so we're not interested in the in the uh, in the kind of snow at the top, which you could always put in there if you wanted to, but this I'm trying to keep this kind of in the autumn here. So this is going to get a little bit darker over toward the edge, all the way out to the side over here. Now we'll just just take a look at this for a minute and see whether that's doing what I want it to do. See how this is a little being a little darker than this part turn curves toward the sun, and that's what we want that to do. Now I'm going to go back to Half Dome back there, and since we have the light coming from this side on on El Capitan, the the dome itself of Half Dome is going to be kind of dark. This is going to be in shadow here, so I'm going to darken this a little bit just to uh, to begin to get that get that feeling a little that the light is coming from this from the upper right hand side of the of the painting. And this throws a shadow clear down in the canyon. If you're up there, Mirror Lake is way down at the bottom of that canyon, and it gets very shadowy in the afternoon down there. So we can just begin to to uh, feel the the strength of Half Dome back there. That was really a really literally it was a whole dome once, and and half of it is just sheared away and dropped down into the into the canyon down below. So now the rocks in front of that, same thing. Now as they get down into the canyon, that'll get a little bit a little bit deeper in value. We'll keep it up, up in the sunshine, we'll keep it a little bit lighter. As it gets down here in the canyon, it gets a little bit darker. Now watch what that, see that, that'll help push this other mountain back into the, into the distance back here. This will get a little bit of color on that after a while, but we'll just hold back from doing that too soon. Now, we get these textures up here. Look at all those striations, nice marks that are in there. I don't want to kill all that texture by putting too much paint on this, so I keep that paint at a minimum going on here. Look at that very dry brush. There's hardly any color in that brush at all. Look what it does. It just keeps enhancing that, that uh, surface all the time. Now that I've worked on this mountain in the background, see I've brought that up closer again, so now I have to make these things again pop forward a little bit more. So I'm going to work on the rocks and the, and the thistles in the foreground to make that to jump forward a little bit so I feel that, that feeling of space back in there again.
as I stood back and looked at the, at the painting, I noticed this real dark shape that comes down here ends up looking like a fish hook, and that really is a, is a demanding thing to see in the, in the painting. So I have to get rid of some of that. As I try to figure out what to do with it, I, I held some paper in here, so, you know, I'm looking to see what happens if I block some of this out. And I noticed also that this line for this hill back here is a little bit too steep. This is the right line here, and that should be about that same way here. That maybe will take care of that fish hook like thing. So let me collage some more, uh, some paper in that part, and we'll see once what, uh, what that'll do. If I, if I cover this up in here, just put some glue in here, and, and uh, add a few pieces of paper in here, it'll gradually get almost white again. I can almost get it as light as, I, as the paper was to start with. And, uh, and then I can repaint that, that uh, shape in there just so it's a little bit, a little bit flatter. Yeah, that's fine. Now, I don't get that hook shape in there at all. I don't feel that in there at all. So that was a good, a good move to do that. Here, I can bring this down across the paper again here. That's nice. That's working nicely now. When we began this painting, we were working with a couple of, of uh, old paintings, using that as a, as a means of, of getting subject matter. Our initial premise was to try to take those elements and put them into a, into a new context. And what we've done is to paint Yosemite Valley with all of its textures and everything in that, in that kind of an idea. So texture is really the most important thing. Textures in the distance, textures up close, and the difference between those two. We also worked very strongly in this painting with value contrast, and value contrast is really very important. It's really a painting that concerns value contrast and texture. As far as color is concerned, we're working with a very, very limited palette. A few brown colors, some green colors, and some grays, a little bit of blue. That's all the color that we, uh, that we have used in the painting. This way of working with rice paper and transparent watercolor is a way to expand your own feelings about about uh, or working with watercolor, your own techniques of working with watercolor. I think that that trying this, working first with those maybe small uh, little little uh, collages, and then developing into something like this, will help you expand your entire range of working as far as transparent watercolor is concerned. <laughs>